Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We don't do, or do work six days to have this day of rest. And we've talked about the component. We talked about what we do those six days, how we should give ourselves to serving for the glory of God as followers of Christ. We also talked about as well uh, the reality that uh, it connects us back to our purpose, the purpose that we have to follow God's example, to create this rhythm for us, for our benefit and also for the benefit of God himself. Uh, we talked about the necessity of rest and what that really means. And today we want to talk about another component that we're going to find here in Leviticus. And uh, if nothing else, I hope this gives us reasons. We just sang a moment ago, 10,000 reasons. We have every reason to worship our God as we seek to follow him. And now maybe that's a new concept to you. or Maybe that's something you've uh, been a follower of Christ for a long period of time. Maybe that's just something like, what does that mean? But what a privilege it is as we begin to re-realize and rehearse the reality that indeed God made us. There is a God and he has loved us and he sent his son to be our savior and he wants to empower us in this life to be different people than we would be otherwise. And more importantly, probably most importantly because of its longevity, is simply this, to be uh, headed to an eternity with Christ in heaven and enjoy the glories of being with him forever when this life comes to an end. So we're gonna talk about a time to worship this morning and I want you to go to uh, verse 3 of Leviticus 23. It gave you a little head start to get there. And I just want to read uh, this verse because uh, he mentions the Sabbath. It says in verse 3, Six days shall work be done. But on the seventh is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall, not, you shall do no work in, on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, this verse that I just read to you comes in the midst of a chapter where he begins detailing God delivering to Moses what is now recorded in the scriptures, the, the, the plan for a year. This is, the, this is the yearly schedule for the sons of Israel. Uh, this is how we order our days. And it's interesting, uh, the law, and for us as New Testament believers, sometimes looking at that law, these law passages, it seems like that seems so cumbersome and so, you know, just sort of, flooding with everything in their life. Well, part of the reason was he wanted to remind them in all their lives, when they got dressed, how they ate, how they, how they worked, how they treated each other, even their schedule weekly, their schedule yearly. He says, I just want to remind you that I'm with you. I'm your God. I brought you to this place. I want to live life with you. So that is what is going on. Now, so let's just think for a moment what we know about the Sabbath in their system. Sunday through uh, you know, the next six days, do your work. And then on the seventh day, which for them was Saturday, was a day to rest, to not do work. You see that right in the text. But there's a little phrase there in verse 3 that I want you to look at. And I want you to just highlight these words, at least in your mind. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. So part of what's going on is whatever those words mean. A whole, this is a holy convocation, and maybe you already have some concept of, of, a con, of a convocation. In the original Hebrew, it's actually just one word. But it's a word that doesn't just mean get together, because you can get together for all sorts of things. You can get together for a sporting event. You can get together with your friends. You can get together for some sort of social or civic or political event. That's a gathering together. But this particular term, and the reason the translators use the word holy in it is because this is for spiritual purposes. This is for God's purpose. This is for us to be the followers of God, to gather together. It's a holy gathering, a holy getting together. And what they would do on the Sabbath day, they would certainly cease from their labors. They would follow that pattern. But also there was a gathering for worship. And they would gather for worship. And that's what we want to think about this morning. And the great thing is, that's what you've done. That's what you've done. Now, for some of us, this is just as regular as turning the, the page on the calendar to the next page. We're just here. Maybe for you, this is not regular. Or maybe this is new to you and you think, I'm not sure what's even going on around me. Well, stand by. I'm going to fill in some of the blanks for you. Okay, this is what is going on around you. And it's a good thing. And it's a great thing for us to be together. So there's some th few things we can just kind of get together. And I want to just start putting together a definition. And uh, we're going to think about that. Uh, first of all, it is a, a gathering, a gathering, a gathering, coming together, people being together. And there's something very special about that. 
Have you ever been to an event where you expected to be people and you go there and you're like, you're the only one there? Or just a handful of you there? And you start thinking, was that tonight or was that some other night? What's wrong? What do they know that I don't know? So there's something that, that's special when we come together. And we, we do things collectively together, like we've just sung together a few moments ago. Uh, so it's a gathering. But not only that, look at the end of this, look at this verse. Because he's speaking to all of Israel. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall no work, do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It's not just a, a, a gathering. It's a gathering that is for all believers. These believers in the Old Testament, it's true for us. Now, this is not the seventh day. This is the first day of a new week. And we've talked about this, hit this sort of obliquely a few times. But uh, by the time Christ comes and the church becomes in this reality, a church now made up of Jew and Gentile together, uh, God's going to bring about this, this new thing at that particular time. Uh, because Christ was raised on the first day of the week, the worship just sort of switched from the seventh day to the first day. So we're gathering, following in that tradition. And the important thing is not necessarily when the day is, it's the day, that the day is kept. A day that we take a break from our normal routine and we have a holy gathering that is for all believers. A sacred assembly is how some translations would even translate that phrase you see there in verse 3. Uh, it's a day of solemn rest, a sacred assembly. So what we do right now for, for us as believers is normative, it's expected, it's part and parcel of who we are and what indeed we do because it's a sacred assembly. In essence, we could say, right now, as we gather together, we're doing exactly what God wants us to be doing. There's sometimes, don't we face this? I, I'm at this point in life, I don't know exactly what God wants me to do. Should I go this direction? Should I go this direction? Should I take this step? Should I not take this step? Uh, you know, all sorts of things we don't really know about, and we try to lean on Him and find a determinant answer. But what should we do at least one day a week? It's right here in black and white, right in the text in front of you that we would keep a sacred assembly, that we would keep a holy convocation to the Lord. Now, please mark your place in uh, Leviticus 23 if you go on this journey with me, or if you just want to listen, that's fine. But I want to take a quick jaunt over to Luke chapter 4. Uh, excuse me, Luke, uh, yeah, Luke chapter 4, because I want to add one more component that you see in the life of Jesus, okay? And this is chapter 4, verse 16, Gospel of Luke. There's several places in the New Testament I could read these same, pretty much the same exact words to you because this, is, this does repeat. And this is in the midst of a story where Jesus goes back to the town he grew up in named Nazareth. And while he is there, by the way, I'm going to show you some pictures of Nazareth tonight, but you've got to come back for that. Anyway, uh, Nazareth, and indeed he's going back to the synagogue where they would have worshipped. And <clears throat> later in Jewish history... They, they developed because they were, they were spread out. They couldn't all get back to the tabernacle or the temple regularly. So in their communities, they created places of worship known as synagogues. And this is what it says. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And then 18 and 19 give us that quote that Jesus read. So not only was he gathering with the others to worship, he was given the privilege to open the scrolls of Isaiah and read them. And this is part of his prophetic and messianic unfolding. And we don't have time to get into that. But the part I want to emphasize is simply this. It was his custom. It was, we'll add to this, this definition we're building on the screen in front of you, we're going to add this. It is a regular gathering of all believers. So what is the Sabbath as far as this holy convocation? That's the whole statement, okay? It is a regular, one day a week, in our case the first day. It is a gathering, we come together, and it's for all believers. So you've done that. Check mark that off your list today, okay? But it means more than just walking through the door. It means more than just sitting in that comfortable seat and very patiently and very kindly listen to that guy up there talking to you, okay? Uh, there needs to be some reality of heart and some things that we need to think about and think about what are the components of heart and components of our gathering that need to be there. Now, if you're still in Leviticus 23, if you want to go back to Leviticus 23, there's something else I want to show you. 
Uh, we've talked about that it says on, this, you know, on the seventh day is the day of Sabbath. We read that in verse 3. But if you kind of want to just uh, uh, scroll down the page for just a moment, go down to verse 24 for one example. Because he's telling the pattern throughout all of their year, all right? So in verse 24 it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy, a holy convocation. So this is an extra Sabbath in addition to the weekly Sabbath. If you go down to verse 27, it says, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. And uh, that's what happens on the day of atonement. So think about this. They had their weekly Sabbaths, and then they had extra Sabbaths throughout the year. Would you like to take a guess of how many extra Sabbaths they had throughout the year? If you guess seven, you're absolutely correct. And that is by design. And then in the seventh month, we had two extra Sabbaths. So God just sort of like, let's just kind of pile this up to kind of get this programmed into our minds of thinking that we need to do this regularly, especially the, the weekly Sabbath. Then every seventh year was a year of Sabbath rest. And they in an agricultural society were required to do this. You don't plant in the seventh year. Whatever comes up of its own accord... You can eat of that fruit. You can eat of what you've stored up in previous years. But you let the land rest in the seventh year. And then, one more, stand by. I know this is complicated, but you're wide awake and you're going to get this. Okay. So there's the weekly Sabbath. There's the extra Sabbath. There's seven of them. Seventh month, there's two extra Sabbaths. Then there's every seventh year, there's a year of Sabbath rest. And then after seven cycles of seven years, which is 49... Then you had the year of Jubilee, which was a day of national Sabbath. In fact, lots of things happened. Debts were canceled. If you had leased or sold land, it went back to its ancestral uh, ownership and all these things. It's sort, of like, it's sort of like a big reboot button that everyone in a normal lifespan would experience at least once in their life, a, 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 just a time of Sabbath. By the way, Israel did not practice that, and they got in trouble with God over it as well. But the point of the matter is that this Sabbath rest, this rest from, work, rest from work and gathering together is part and parcel of their history and it's part and parcel of biblical history. So in the Old Testament prior to the synagogue worship, which happens really after the Babylonian exile or throughout the Babylonian exile and carries on, they gathered together, the scriptures were taught, they praised and sang and worshiped God with their voices, all right? Uh, in the synagogue, they did the same thing, except they gathered together. In the temple, there were sacrifices. That did not happen in the synagogue. They also had something else, typically a synagogue, and I've actually seen these in Israel, or they would dig just sort of like a bathtub-shaped, you know, in a depression in the ground. It would be filled with water, and that's where people who coming to worship would go down into this water and immerse themselves in the water. Now, we practice New Testament baptism. We do that to show our faith, typically once. But they would do this regularly. They would come, you think about going to worship. You come to worship, whoosh, and then you walk into worship God. That would get your attention. It'd probably wake you up, depending on the water temperature. But nonetheless, that was part of what they did. Now, you come to the church where we exist, in the time which we exist. We gather on the first day. We, uh, we gather together. The scriptures are taught. We have singing and praise. All those things reflect the Old Testament reality. We do not offer sacrifice because Jesus made the one sacrifice forever, but we do commemorate that regularly with communion, not every Sunday, but regular. Uh, we give our gifts, and they would do that by bringing their gifts to the temple. We bring our gifts to support the work of God, and then we've already talked about baptism. So I say that to say this. The regular you see in that phrase in front of you means regular for us all the time, but it's regular through the continuing process of God through time. God wants us to do that, and he makes a big deal to communicate that to us. So how should we respond? How do we, how do we respond to this? How should we respond? Well, first of all, we need, to, we need to respond by keeping a regular pattern of sacred assembly, a regular pattern of holy convocation, a regular pattern of coming to worship and finding the cycle of rest. If you want you as a, your life as a believer to line up with God's pattern, that has to be part of the pattern. We shouldn't just work ourselves to death, but take a day where we can take a break. Now, I understand that's not in a legalistic sense. You go home and there's water squirting out of a pipe under the counter. 
you're going to, you know, get on your work clothes and do what you can do about it, okay? So we understand it. But it's not in a legalistic sense, but that's our pattern. We want to just stop all that stuff, take some time to listen, and we, part of what we do, we gather together for worship. We gather together because it's a regular part of God's plan, not just because it's a regular thing that we do. It's sort of whatever happens that way. We also, in our hearts, need to see created within us anticipation for what we're doing. I know sometimes, I, I, sometimes I've heard children say it. Maybe sometime in my past I said it. But sometimes it seems a little bit, I hate to even, I hate to even say this because it might put the wrong thing in your mind. But going to church and sitting still for a while, and well, it can just seem a little boring at times. This is not as entertaining as, you know, what you can go down to the Civic Center and buy a ticket for. Uh, maybe this just seems a little bit dated or stale. Now, part of that is the people up here doing what we do to lead in worship. I mean, I don't want to bore you with the Word of God. What a sin that would be, right? So, we, you know, there needs to be some effort to actually communicate the truth and to do that in a way. But we also need to come with anticipation. Now, what I'm about to tell you should not shock you, but I'm not a big fan of, as far as a performing art, of dance. I do not own a subscription to go to the ballet. That's not going to shock you, I know. Uh, part of it is because I have no coordination to even think about anything for me to do that. Uh, so I don't do that. I don't watch Dancing with the Stars. I'm sorry. If that's your show, I'm sorry. I don't even know if that's show, show still on. I have no clue because uh, it's not my thing. Uh, but I, over the last few years, I did the calculation, I have attended seven dance recitals. Now, these things usually take place on a Saturday where I usually have other things I could be doing. Some of them involve travel great distance to go to these dance recitals, and they usually last about three hours. So over the last few years, I've spent 21 hours of my life at dance recitals, and I will never get those hours back. But you know what? I enjoyed every single one. Not because I appreciate the dance. You know, I, I, can, I can try to get artsy and think about, you know, what they're doing. And you can appreciate the athleticism and the practice and the coordination and the, the rhythm and all that. But the reason they were special is because we had grandchildren in these recitals. And yeah, you sit there for three hours for them to come out in a neat little costume, a bunch of other little children, and they do their three-minute dance. And then you have three hours of watching everybody else's kids come out and do their little dance. All right? Because it's rude to leave before, you know, it's over. Or what, uh, there's one that we've gone to, they figured this out, all right? Everybody watches all their kids dance their three minutes. You sit there for three hours. But then we're having the grand finale at the end where all the kids have come back on stage. You can't leave before that's over, right? They've got this figured out. But the reason it's interesting to me is not what necessarily is going on, but who I love in this mix. And my camera's out, and I'm taking pictures and video, and... It's just a moment because I love to see my grandchildren. If this seems a little dated to you, if this seems a little boring to you, if the speaker you have to endure this morning is not the greatest speaker you've ever heard, we come together because we are meeting not with just, we love the people. I love being with you. I love being with my friends. We come to meet with the God who made us, the God who loved us, the God who has given us the life of this day. The God who sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. We get to be with him. The God that we anticipate because of faith. That we're going to spend every moment of eternity with. Living in his house, in his city. That's marked by his name. That someday he's not going to be content to just to, when we die and our souls go to be with heaven. Which is true. But someday when Christ comes back and a trumpet sounds and there's a voice of the archangel and the shout of God, he's going to reclaim our bodies from the grave and give us resurrection. And give us bodies like unto Jesus' body after his resurrection. That's who we get to hang out with. That's who we think about. We want to listen to his word. We want to contemplate him. And sometimes I think it's just the raw simplicity of thinking about what we are doing. Oh, it's time to go to church. Hurry up. Grab your Bibles, get out the door, hope there's no you know, construction on the interstate because I've got to get there on time. And we get here and we do our thing. But that anticipation to just stop, maybe that's why he wants us to rest and stop work. To stop and think, what are we doing? For a few moments I get a look into God's word and God is going to teach me something. God is going to speak to me and I get to spend some time with him. Now, we get to spend time with him wherever we are. 
and we need to do that regularly. But there's something about we gather together. We gather together. I was in a church the other night. I had a chance to speak at a church down the way here. And this church is older than our church, and our church is over a century. But it was a big picture of all these people standing in front of this church years ago. I think it was 1948, as I remember seeing the, the date on there. And everyone's lined up, and I'm thinking, boy, that's really good. And the pastor says, that was actually taken at a family reunion that they used the church for the thing. So that's the only picture we could find of that era. And there's just all these people lined up, and all these old cars. You can see them you know, down the road, and this is a big deal. And you just, they, you know, it took a lot of effort. There were no interstates in 1949, okay? Uh, it, it took effort to get there. Not everybody had, you know, a high-powered car like you have to get there. And, and they're together because they wanted to be with God's, with their family, and we need to want to be with God's family. That's what we want to do. So let me just share three quick things that's going to help us kind of encapsulate our thoughts this morning. This regular pattern. Number one, all right, you ready? Do this. Gather unless you really can. And my, my, my appeal to you is make sure the word really is really real. Okay? In other words, if you're sick and contagious, please don't come to church. Just flip on the live stream and you can follow from there. Okay? That, that's okay. But if you can, if not, God's not preventing you, you're not having a you know, crazy work schedule, if the pipes aren't flooding the house or whatever, make this your regular commitment to gather because it's been the pattern from the beginning. Gather together one day a week for a holy convocation, a sacred assembly, to do these things, to spend time with me, to be excited about being with me. So just make that your pattern. And you know what's going to happen? I'm not, I'm not a prophet, so I'm not making a prophecy. I just, I've lived enough life to know. When we make commitments, there's always going to be something that challenges it, something that gets in the way, something that's going to make it harder to fulfill that. But I think it's an act of worship this morning. It's what God says was his pattern. It's a pattern that continues on. Uh, it can patterns on, even into the, the last book of the Bible. The Apostle John in verse 9 of chapter 1 says, when God gives him this great revelation, which is the rest of the book, the end time story, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, first day of the week. He was worshiping God, and God spoke to him. So throughout the Bible, from, from the very first chapter, first chapter where God took a rest to the last book of the Bible, you see this concept of having this regular thing. Number two, gather for two purposes additional. Number one, gather to hear from God. Gather to hear from God. Well, God can speak to me anywhere, yes. God can speak to me on a mountaintop, yes. God can speak to me from the beach, yes. God can speak to me through what I'm experiencing. You know, a big hurricane hit Florida and went up and flooded great places up in, the, in Tennessee and the mountains and Carolinas and all that. And I, we pray for those people that are hurt, and there's a lot of you know, death and all that. But you know what? At some point, we just need to understand that that teaches something about our weakness. We can see a storm coming. We can put plywood over the windows. We can head to higher ground. But you know what? When the storm comes, we do not have any ability to stop it. We need a higher power. We need someone to look out for us in reality. So we need to hear from him. Thirdly, we need to make sure that we gather for God to hear from us. Well, God can hear me anytime. I can pray anywhere. Absolutely you can, and I trust you do. But God created a pattern for us to gather in a holy convocation, a sacred assembly. We gather together to study the scriptures. We gather together to sing. We give, gather to give. We gather to express our faith and to encourage each other. I thank you for these times that I get to spend time sharing God's word with you. Nothing I'd rather do. And I thank you for your encouragement and your support. But this is what God wants us to do. It's what God wants us to be here. And maybe here this morning you say, I, well, I can understand why you would say that. You don't want to preach to empty seats every week. You don't want to teach to an empty, empty building every week. That indeed is true. I don't deny that. But it's far more than what I want. It's what God wants for us to gather together. And you've kept that commitment this morning. God bless you for that. Let's just keep it up. And maybe you and I could be used to encourage someone else to keep up that commitment as well. And, uh, and those people that can't be with us because of health or situation, and you, you miss them and you see they're not there, maybe you can reach out and express your love to them and tell them they were missed and tell them that you want to see them and you want to pray for them, whatever you could do. 
Friends, when we do what we're doing now, God smiles. God listens. God blesses. God is shared with each other. God is honored. So on this day, we honor him. As we honor him throughout the week in our work, we honor him. But seven days from now, let's keep our commitment to honor him. Because God is above and beyond everything. As I said, maybe this seems strange to you because maybe you've never started that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The great news is the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath that we looked at uh, recently is also the Lord of all he made us therefore we're responsible to him we all have come short of his standards of morality we're sinners as the Bible declares it to be that's a very open thing that's not a secret the remedy for sin is the shedding of blood Jesus died on the cross his blood was shed to pay the price it's in essence you have a gift waiting that's paid in full all you have to do is take it and run with it pick it up and go that gift is eternal life. That gift is your sins forgiven. That gift is him being in your life. That gift is heaven forever. All you have to do is take it all fully paid for. That's the one we come to love and serve today. And if you've never accepted your gift, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to trust in him. If we could help you, uh, Pastor Adam's going to be here at the front after the service. I'll be in the back for a few minutes. You want to talk to one of us? Fine. If you can talk to the Lord in the privacy of your own heart. Or maybe come with a Christian friend or family member that could have that conversation with you as well. Indeed, it has been a time to worship. It's always time to worship. But God calls us back as he says, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do new work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. May God help us to do just that.